Okay, so let's talk Dr. Doom. Mr. Doom, Vic, let's talk about Vic. Here is an extremely condensed history of Victor Von Doom. He was born in a small European country called Latveria, specifically in a Romani camp outside of Latveria. His mom dies when he's very young because of a deal gone wrong with Mephisto, AKA Marvel's literal fucking devil. His dad dies of exposure not long after. Angry at the world for taking away his parents, but more specifically his mother, we never really hear about his dad again. Victor becomes obsessed with finding a way to contact and save his mother's soul. At some point, I don't know where, Victor makes it to New York, where he gets a scholarship to State University, where he becomes roommates with Reed Richards and they fucking hate each other. Reed Richards is the Reed Richards, AKA hyper-rational dickbag, and Dr. Doom is the most pretentious man you've ever met, so obviously they are not going to get along. However, they are equally smart, meaning that they will debate back and forth about random scientific bullshit late into the night. In fact, they become essentially scientific rivals. While Reed Richards is developing spaceships to try and fly into the fucking sky and, you know, give his entire family superpowers, Vic is back in their fucking dorm room doing some unethical ass experiments. You see, he's trying to create a machine to be able to send his astral form into literally fucking hell so that he can either A, fight, or B, bargain with Mephisto. Well, as sketchily jury-rigged portals to hell assembled in your dorm room with confiscated parts unethically sourced from state university tend to go, it goes wrong and explodes in his face, scarring him for life, debatably over his whole face, but if you listen to Jack Kirby, just this one scar, unless you actually, like, read the comic where it shows his whole head is scarred. Anyway, it explodes and he gets expelled for, you know, unethical experience about building a portal to hell in his dorm room. And Victor goes, fine, if I can't unethically source my parts from State University in New York, I'll just go back to Latveria and, you know, depose the king. And, um, and, and he does that. Well, technically first he stops by a couple of Tibetan monks who build him a suit of armor and then put a searing hot mask onto his face, scarring him for life even more. And then with his newly decked out suit of dope ass armor, then he deposes the king and then crowns himself dictator and then doctor. Like scientifically, yes, he's brilliant. He probably deserves the doctor, like, d title. But he never actually, you know, g got a doctorate. He's just a dictator of a country and decided that, yeah, I can do that, and just declared himself a doctor. University of Latveria, doctorate in dictatorship. I'm not sure. Doom is so many levels of extra and it's so funny looking at his origins because they don't really make sense for a dude who mostly resides in a snow-capped castle wearing a suit of armor and a cloak. Dude was roommates with Reed Richards and now he spends most of his day sitting in a throne. I mean, you can't fault the hustle. God damn. He doesn't have a great plan to avoid getting murdered by Batman for what he just did. No, 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 because it's even funnier than that. Not only did Joker not have a plan for what he was going to do after he killed Jason Todd, he didn't realize that that might have been a bad idea until after he had already done it. He spends like 10 minutes beating the shit out of Jason only to then go, <sighs> well, that was fun. Oh shit, Batman's gonna kick my ass. And I quote, he's a vengeful one, that bat. This could get sticky, says over the damn near corpse of Jason Todd. The fact that he got diplomatic immunity like the next fucking day, not only not in the cards, I don't think anyone would have made that fucking bet. Joker straight up made the worst fucking decision of his entire life, and then God himself was like, eh, maybe let this one slide. Do you want to know why he blows Jason up? Why he straps Jason and his mother to a fucking post and then blows up the goddamn building? Because he just realized that he spent 10 minutes beating the ever-loving shit out of Robin and goes, ah, fuck. I need to make sure Batman doesn't know that that was me. Because he knows what will happen, and he had no fucking plan outside of this seems fun right now. Joker is so fucking stupid up until the exact moment that comics decided he was a genius. Because Batman straight up was gonna kill him. After he becomes the Iranian ambassador, Batman corners him in a hotel room and is like, Dude, I'm giving you one fucking chance. Go back to Arkham. To which the Joker, like the fucking moron he is, says, nah, man, I got a way better plan than that. Fuck you. In fact, I'm gonna throw out like six different insults about your dead fucking kid. What's his galaxy brain genius fucking plan, you may ask? It's gas bombing the UN, which he already knows is protected by Superman because he's a fucking moron who doesn't think this shit through. To which Batman basically just responds to him like,
boy. Oh, thank God. You insulting my dead child six times in a row really confirmed the fact that you fucking did it. So it's gonna make this next part a hell of a lot easier. Because after Joker was a fucking moron in Death in the Family, Batman's end goal is murder this motherfucker. In fact, Everyone knows that Batman's goal is gonna be to murder this motherfucker so much that the UN hires Superman to be like, dude, dude, I need you to back off. The murder boner for this guy is going to start an international incident and we can't be fucking having that. To which Batman's response is, and I quote, that's the law not justice. And he tries to do it anyway, because Joker's an idiot who thought that Batman, the known vigilante criminal, was going to adhere to the law. Moral of the story is this. The Joker is fucking stupid and always was, up until about 2008, where we all collectively decided that he was actually secretly a genius this whole time. So I'm not sure if I wasn't specific enough in the naming, or if the fact that it's been so sporadic in the past hasn't gotten that point across, but um... Regrettable superhero happens whenever the fuck I feel like it, all right? I've gotten comments, I've gotten messages, I've had people fucking DM me to tell me that I need to do this shit again. I'm getting fucking YouTube comments telling me I need to do more. Guys, I have unmedicated ADHD. Sometimes I just fucking forget. It's called the weekly, not weekly show. With all of that said, yeah, I haven't done any in like a month and a half. I need to get on that. So, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Who are we getting this month? I'm gonna be so real with you. It's been so long, I don't even remember if the last one was good or not. But you better be. You better be. Give me someone fun. Da Dial H for Hero? I've heard of this one, but wait a minute, I've heard of this one before. I'm like 98% sure that this is like a very well-known character. Or I could be wrong. I could also be wrong. Is this... Is this like Firestorm, but, but fucking Rotary? Why is Captain Epilepsy fighting the thing? The most original character in comics history. Okay, but so we're just, we're just going to act like this isn't just Shazam with a Rotary phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Rotary dial singular. He's Ben 10. He, he's just Ben 10. Just, just Ben 10. The, the, that's, that's it. Dial H for Hero was created by Dave Wood and Jim Mooney in House of Mystery number 156 of DC Comics in January of 1966. There is no official name for the superhero who holds the Dial H for Hero dial, mostly because every superhero that the dial changes you into is a completely different superhero with a completely different name, costume, powers, everything. You know, like Ben 10. The original user of the dial was a kid by the name of Robbie Reed, who found it in a cave outside of Littleville, USA. The central shtick here is that if you dial the letters H E R-O on the dial, you would transform into a superhero. Usually one that was strangely fit to be able to conquer the bad guy at hand. Its initial run in the 60s lasted about 24 issues until the writers fucking ran out of ideas and the dial was shelved until the 1980s where they picked it back up again and let the fans decide who the superhero would turn into. But even that wasn't enough to save the character because then he was eventually just kind of pushed into the background and he's kind of been in and out of comics ever since then. I would put in my two cents on whether this is regrettable or not if this wasn't just Ben 10. It's Ben 10. It's cool. But you can't revive him because he's Ben 10. It exists already. I mean, for fuck's sake, I would say that Ben 10 is probably the closest thing to an adaptation of Dial H for Hero, which is probably why Ben 10 feels like a superhero show. I am honestly wondering if at one point it was an adaptation of this, or if the creators had any creative ties to this. I don't know, but it would be cool to research, so somebody do that. I don't really have a This Exists Already sticker, so I'm just gonna give it a stamp of approval because this is a good idea. It's just been, you know, used. More so, more successfully used elsewhere. This costume is still dumb as shit, though. Let me explain to you the exact reason that we shouldn't do this. I was looking back through my drafts again, and I found that, uh, that I, I recorded that first bit when I was still moving out of the apartment. It's October. I did that in December. Still a terrible idea, though. Let's talk about it. There should not be a CG animated movie based off of Alex Ross's artwork for the exact same reason that people say that Watchmen is unfilmable. And that is to say certain art forms are designed for certain mediums. Watchmen, as a concept in its storytelling, is based around the comic book medium. Its story centrally focuses on the lives of comic book characters, not the movie versions of those comic book characters, but comic book characters. Specifically comic book characters in the time that they came out. 
It is a very dated but very good piece of comic book media. Remember when the animated Super Sons movie came out and it had an art style that was almost exactly Jorge Jimenez's art style? Like here's what Superboy and Robin looked like in the Super Sons comic, and here's what they looked like in the movie. It's very obviously supposed to be the same art style. In motion? This looked a little weird. Because of the necessity for art to stay on model, the more fluid art style of Jorge Menes didn't really come through. It was a good attempt, but it wasn't really there. It is unbelievably difficult to capture the very fluid and open art style of comic art in animation. Because in comic art, characters don't need to be built on model. Characters don't need to stay in one form. And sure, there's squash and stretch techniques that like movies like Spider-Verse has shown us looks good in 3D. But that usually needs a budget behind it. A budget that usually doesn't come through with animated comic book movies. The closest that we can get to maintaining a comic book's art style while still making it an animated movie is when it's 2D animated because it's roughly the same idea just with a hell of a lot more frames. Characters don't need to stay on model because they're drawn every single fucking frame so it makes it a lot easy that's how you get movies like under the red hood and superman batman public enemies that look like the comics that they came from while still looking good in animation here's the problem with alex ross though what word would you use to describe this art style the word that i would use is realistic is this photo real of course not it's very painterly but this is a lot more of a human body shape than comic books usually do. Fabric has texture and wrinkles and humans have facial flaws and wrinkles. Things that are not often portrayed in comic book artwork. So if I was trying to make an animated movie based on this art style quickly with very little budget, the word I would probably use is make it look realistic. But how would you do that without pulling a Mars Needs Moms or a Polar Express and making it look uncanny valley weird and if you're already going to do it realistic why don't you just do it in live action and now you're in an infinite loop you either a abandon the art style completely which removes an entire section of this historic graphic novel that people love or b you try and animate this incredibly intricate detailed art style in a 3d fashion that's not going to be the exact same as it is in the book therefore lowering the value and essentially changing the art style and that's not even getting into the fact that i don't think kingdom come should ever be Made into a movie. Again, using the Watchmen example, it is a comic book about comics at the time. It is literally a story about the old guard of superheroes coming in and trying to forcefully stop the new generation of violent superheroes who mostly fight with each other by becoming overbearing and totalitarian and lowering themselves to their standards, therefore ruining their own morals. The book came out in 1996. It was critiquing 90s comics. For fuck's sake, the main bad guy is explicitly designed to look like he was made by Rob Liefeld. Kingdom Come is my favorite book of all time. Not comic, book. I have read it more times than I can count, and I could probably quote every single piece of it. I have wanted a splash page from that book as a back piece for my entire adult life, and I never want to see it adapted to a movie, ever. I do not think there is a way to do it that can do it justice, especially given the context that it is seeped in. Do I love it? Do I recommend it as a book that everybody should read? Absolutely. But don't make it into a movie, and dear God, don't make it Uncanny Valley CGI. But go read Kingdom Come. Mark Waid and Alex Ross are gods. I have never read a bad Mark Waid book, and Alex Ross art style is fucking incredible. All right, we're far enough into this video that nobody's going to be watching at this time, so I'll see you guys in the next one. Do you guys want to know what one of my favorite parts of this job is? There's a lot of ups and downs to my particular position, but one of the absolute best is that when you see someone local, a company, a, a, a group of people, neighbors, who have a really good idea, who have something that's really worth it, you don't have to wait for their name to get out there because you just have the ability to get it out there for them. Which leads me to the topic of today's video, which is about two streets down from me, literally the same house two streets away, my neighbors own a dice company. Their company is called Primus Dice, and I think that you guys should check them out. Now, while dice companies themselves aren't very few and far between, Primus has a very specific thing that I think sets them apart. You see, every one of their sets of dice has a story behind it from their own table. So every single set of dice that you get has its own background, has its own storyline. And every single one of those storylines is told right under the dice set when you click on it. The example that I'm showing right now is my favorite set called Blood and Honor. Which, like I have to say, look.
look at it glimmering in the sun. These dice are absolutely beautiful when you get them out of the packaging. Like this set called Max's Inferno that has all of these like gold shards in it to make it look like an explosion. This one's story is literally based off of that old D&D trope of I didn't ask how big the room is, I said cast fireball. Or this one called Fields of Elysium that's based after a knight waking up in his promised afterlife. Seriously, every single one of these dice sets that they have on their website is absolutely gorgeous, and I encourage you to check them out and find the story that speaks to you. And I want you to know, I'm not ranting and raving about this because they're paying me. They're my neighbors, and I just want to support them because this is really cool. So hey, if you get the chance, check out Primus Sharp Edge Dice. They're some of the nicest people that I've ever met. They make some of the coolest resin dice that I've ever seen, and I honestly just want to give them a shout out. Because seriously, just look at how cool that is. All right, sure, let's talk about it. So I'm not entirely sure if I need to say it or not, but I am a little bit of a Red Hood fan. And for the longest time, I was so mad that no one actually debates Red Hood's plan in the comic or the movie. The entire argument against Jason Todd's plan is that he's killing people and that if Batman did it, he would go insane. Which is fair, but Jason doesn't say that Batman should do it. He debates that Batman should kill the Joker. That's his big thing. But not once does Batman actually, like, sit down and actually analyze what Jason is doing and how it's wrong. And for a very long time, I was like, yeah, it was working. It's stated in the comic that the crime rate is being lowered. Until I got a couple years on me and realized, yeah, it's because it's the early days of a mafia. Jason just reinvented the mob and just made it really big. Jason's plan never would have worked large scale and it never would have worked long term. But because in the comic, nobody actually debates him on that and everyone just goes, you're killing people, it's wrong. We never get the chance to get into how Jason's plan would have actually not worked because Jason just became a mob boss. That's it, that's all he did. Like, yeah, he's got some very specific rules. Don't sell to children. Uh, anybody who does anything to kids immediately gets killed. But he was just running an organized crime family. And here's the thing. If we actually got some reason after Under the Red Hood why the crime family that Jason Todd instituted stopped working, then we would have had some meat to it. And we would have had an interesting direction for Jason's character to go. But because we didn't, he gets reduced to DC's Punisher and the whole crime family angle kind of gets ignored. But here's the thing. Even in the comic, people rebel against Jason. Like, people try and sell under his nose and do shit that he doesn't approve of, and he goes out and he fucking handles it. But, like, that would never stop. The same way that the Moronis and the Falcones and everything in Gotham just keep going? It's because he's not making crime not a possibility, he's reducing crime to what he deems is acceptable, which is a mob. Granted, Batman's mission will never end. In a city like Gotham that's run by the elites, there is no eradicating crime. Crime reduces when poverty reduces, and poverty is like the main backbone of Gotham's infrastructure. But here's the thing, if we saw the Red Hood crime family fall apart, if we saw what happened to make it go away, I think Jason could have gone in a really interesting direction as a failed mob boss. Weirdly enough, I'm gonna point to Arkham Knight as a really good example of this. I guess spoilers for a years old video game. After you defeat Jason in Arkham Knight, he kinda has a breakdown. His own men are like, yeah, he ran off. I think he was crying. It's really sad. And his people stop respecting him. And then they start going to different people. And all of a sudden, this militia that he put together, that he runs, is operating under Deathstroke. Because it's just organized crime. And you can debate that something similar happened in the comic, but because we never see it, we will never know. Jason brings the Joker to Batman. They have their falling out. Jason mysteriously disappears in the explosion. And then he's just kind of a nuisance running around Gotham. He's not operating as a mob boss. He's just kind of there trying to be a better Batman. Like he tries to get the Robins to be his Robin multiple times. And it's just kind of weird. But if we saw the fall of that mob boss mentality, if we saw the power slip through his hands or his plan fail, I think Jason would have a lot of interesting directions to go that weren't just the Punisher. I don't know, let me know your guys' opinion. Or if I didn't read something, if I haven't seen the fact that there is a comic where the Red Hood crime family falls apart. I'm genuinely interested to know. I think, I think as comic fans, there are always those specific books that you read that get every single character wrong. Not one thing about the entire book sticks with what you know about these characters. They're all turned up to 11 and don't resemble the character that you would have in your head if you thought of these characters. 
But you fucking love it anyway. Against all of your better judgment, it just hits every single one of your switches that is just, mmm, that's good. And you feel terrible about it. But God damn it, you can't help but recommend it. I just finished reading Human Target by Tom King and Greg Smallwood. I don't think it gets a single thing right about the entire Justice League International, but fuck me, I love this book. It's a detective noir superhero story. What's not to love other than the characterizations? I'm sorry, okay? You know what? No, I'm not actually done talking about this book. Does The Human Target by Tom King and Greg Smallwood get the characterization of like 80% of its characters completely wrong? Yes. However, there was one specific issue in this series that I love with my whole soul. So I'm gonna describe it so that maybe you might actually read it. So the entire story of Human Target is essentially a detective story. Somebody in the Justice League International tried to have Lex Luthor killed. However, Lex Luthor had hired a body double, and in the remaining days that this body double has left to live, he has decided he's going to track down the person who killed him. That's the basic setup for the story. Now, this issue takes place like halfway or more than halfway through the series. This guy has gotten into some shit, and long and short of it is, he probably has Batman on his tail. Now, this entire issue takes place through the eyes of this guy as he is desperately trying to run from Batman. But here's the kicker. You don't see Batman. You're in this guy's head as he is trying to figure out he has eyes in the sky. He definitely has a satellite on me, but what if he's trying to hide it? What if he actually has a drone following me? No, I would have heard it by now. Wait a minute, what if he's driving behind me? He would have been driving something too flashy. I would have been able to notice him, but he would be able to notice if I looked back, so I can't look back. I can only look through the window. It is one man falling victim to paranoia because he knows, he knows that the Batman is on his tail. And simply the thought of that is so terrifying that he will constantly Constantly be looking over his shoulder, panicking at every waking moment. And oh my god, it's so good. You never get to see that in Batman stories because it focuses on Batman. This focuses on someone who is straight up just prey. And it is so good to read. Listen, leave your love for the Justice League International at the door, okay? Is this book made for fans of the Justice League International? Yes. But like I said, it does get a lot of their characterizations wrong. This is still Tom King. I really, really enjoy Tom King's books, but one of his things is that he cannot write a character who does not have some debilitating flaw. So every single member of the Justice League International is given a debilitating flaw of some kind. Often ones that they did not originally have, and often ones that very very drastically change their characters. Guy Gardner is not usually that much of a piece of shit. But if you are able to take that, if you're able to take that and run with it, read the book. It's so good. Think of it as an Elseworld story if you need to, because honestly, it is so worth the read. Now, I'm not sure if I ever mentioned it on this account before, but I grew up a bit of a nerd. And growing up a nerd, that means that I played a little game called DC Universe Online. Now, for those of you lucky enough to either be born after this was popular, which I'm not going to analyze that, or simply people who haven't played it, DC Universe Online was essentially a create-your-own-superhero MMO. You'd run around with your favorite superheroes with this OC that you created in the game and basically just be a superhero in the DC Universe. It was great for little artistic nerds like me who love to create their own characters. Now the opening of this game is fairly memorable, especially if you were like me and created a thousand goddamn characters. Essentially what happens is as soon as you hit start, it shows you this opening cinematic that's really well done that shows how Brainiac is going to take over the Earth. It throws you from that cinematic into the character creator, and after you make your character, you wake up on one of Brainiac's ships. You see a bunch of people on Earth have been infected with these things called nanites. Now the nanites are from the future, they have superpowers, but they essentially infect somebody and give them extra abilities. They're Brainiacs, he wants them back, so he's bringing them onto their ship, and he's converting them into essentially his own minions. He's trying to digitize the humans to either get the nanites back or convert them into his own people. Well, you wake up out of one of these pods after being failed to be digitized to find the Thing in disarray. You see the ship is under siege, and you work f through this techno-organic purple ship, meeting some of the allies that you're going to fight with through the rest of the game. You either meet your mentor, or you meet a couple of the other superheroes that you're going to be fighting with, until at the end, you fight Brainiac, or at least one of the models of Brainiac that's on the ship. It's not important. The point is that you fight Brainiac and end up taking the ship down. With a little help from a mysterious voice in your head, if you're a villain, it's Calculator, if you're a superhero, it's Barbara Gordon, whatever, you escape mysteriously unscathed. And then then go into playing the rest of the game. Now, 
Why did I just spend the last couple of minutes describing the entire opening of the game to you? Because someone at Larian Studios definitely played DC Universe Online. Now, am I accusing Larian Studios of taking the entire opening of Baldur's Gate 3 directly from DC Universe Online? No, of course not. I'm just saying that after being kidnapped by the brain-based villain of the universe, taken into his floating ship in the sky that's currently wreaking destruction on the populace, being put into one of the capsules that's either going to transform you into one of him or kill you. You break out of your tube while the ship is under siege, fight your way through the purple techno-organic ship with a bunch of high life, meeting many of your future companions along the way, before eventually engaging in a fight with the brain-based bad guy in question, which results in the ship crashing and you being saved by a mysterious voice in your head. I'm not crazy! I'm not crazy! This matches almost perfectly! Now, Larian, I'm not calling you out for anything. I'm just saying, if you wanted to help out, uh, say, a struggling video game artist currently trying to get a job in the industry, I'd be willing to quiet down just a little bit, you know, just, just not say it so loud. This is a joke, Larian Studios, I love you so much, and I am on my fourth playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn down a job. If you're offering one, I, w I will take it if you're offering one. It's been a fucking week. I dropped off the face of the earth for a week straight. I was gonna return on Monday, and I didn't. Both me and Scarlet got bedridden levels of sick and then just got over it. Wasn't COVID, wasn't the flu. I don't get it. I'm still working through it. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna take it easy on my first day back. Uh, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, now weekly show where I pick one character out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Please get someone who's not going to upset my throat. Come on, someone funny at least. Come, not peacemate. Feet. Phoenix the Protector? It's just gonna be a lawyer. It's gonna be Phoenix Wright, but in like a superhero outfit. He's gonna transform into a superhero mode by just screaming, OBJECTION! Or I could just... Or I could just be wrong. Why does he look boring? Like, usually I make fun of these, but like, honestly, other than the crazy Chewbacca monsters that he's fighting, uh... This dude looks basic. This looks like if you asked somebody at like Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon to just make a superhero. This is some shit they would come up with. This is a character in fucking Powerpuff Girl. Also, terribly sorry to tell you Atlas Comics, but uh, I'm decently sure Man of Tomorrow is trademarked. Also, how do you have a cool ass name like Phoenix and then have your costume reflect none of that? Oh, I'm sorry, he's shooting the, the presumably fire here, but like, come on, nothing? No birds, no capes, no flamboyance, no nothing? Come on, man! Holy shit, this idea slaps. No shit, this, this is a really fucking cool concept for a character. Phoenix the Protector was created by Jeff Rovin and Sam Amendola in Phoenix number one of Atlas Comics in January of 1975. Set in the far off future of, let me check my notes, 1977, astronaut Ed Tyler makes an escape from a doomed space station, Threshold 1. His escape pod, the only one escaping the Threshold 1, lands in the Arctic, where Ed's gonna fucking die. Luckily, though, there's a race of aliens nearby. Seemingly all-powerful, they help out Ed. They pick him up, and they bring him to safety. They then reveal to Ed that they are actually called the DD, and they are responsible for the evolution of humankind. Apparently, they're so all-powerful that they've been manipulating humans behind the scenes and allowing them to evolve. Neat. However, because man has become so violent and terrible, they have decided that it's a failed experiment, and, um... Yeah, they're gonna wipe out all of humankind. Terrified by this, Ed makes a break for it. Stealing one of their alien super suits that has atomic transistors in it, which just, it, it gives him superpowers. Here's where this shit gets crazy. For the remaining issues, Phoenix is essentially Jesus. He says this next bit with the sun behind his head emulating a halo from Renaissance paintings. I am a man to lead them away from evil, to show them the path to their salvation. As did I, so will man rise from the ashes of hatred and prejudice, for I am the Phoenix. Before going to fight the leader of the Deity, who is literally named Satan. At one point, he apparently parts the Hudson River. So maybe he's Moses, he's, he's a Christ figure, like explicitly. However, in the fourth issue, the editors decided that this was all getting a bit much and threw in a race of good aliens that immediately wipe out the Deity. They are called the Protectors, and they give Phoenix a new suit. However, they also give him a warning. The moment that you show hatred, bigotry, greed, or any of the other human plagues, mankind will be 
doomed. And then the fucking publisher folded and we got no more. This is great. This is awesome. Can you imagine a comic coming out right now that explicitly challenges the Christ allegory that is superheroes? Especially in a post Zack Snyder's Superman world that openly addresses and challenges those ideas while also having the character be a superpowered into... Fuck, that's Miracle Man. That's just, that's just Miracle Man. That's what the story of Miracle Man is essentially about. Except instead of being like a Green Lantern slash Superman stand-in, he's Captain Marvel. Son of a bitch. I'm not going back. This isn't regrettable. This is, this is cool. Phoenix the Protector gets the seal of approval, but with the caveat that he's, he's literally just knock off Miracle Man. This video is going to be clipped in all of the ways I don't want it to be clipped, but I feel like this question needs to be asked anyway. What do you think a symbiote feels like? Like, in Marvel, a symbiote is an alien being that sits inside the body of its host, right? But here's the thing, the human body is a very touchy computer. It does not like foreign bodies being inside of its working parts. So, like, what do you think it feels like? Does the symbiote go into your brain and, like, make your body ignore that feeling? Because symbiotes aren't small. That's an entire other being that can fully encapsulate and make you bigger than you are. Like, humans get sick when bacteria enters their body. Imagine an entire alien being. I don't know, stitch this and tell me your opinion. What do you think a symbiote would feel like? In your muscles and under your skin and it comes out of your pores, just bleh. You don't need to know. You don't need to know. You don't need to know. I have a goddamn hashtag named after the one that everybody thinks you are. You don't need to fucking know. Now I know for a goddamn fact. Now let's try this one more goddamn time and this time you get it fucking right. What the fuck? It was the Mohawk. It's the Mohawk. We're gonna blame it on the Mohawk and the Blue Jay. My, my, my name is Jay. It's fine. It, we're goddamn. I just, I just have to go. I just have to go until I get it because there's a right answer. There's a right answer. Are you fucking getting me? That is the wrong red bat. Now you better stop fucking playing with me and give me the answer that everybody knows is the right. God. Giving you one more fucking chance. I'm giving you one more fucking chance, and you better pick the right god. Oh, come on! So here is a really fun part about living in my house. As I've shown multiple times before, my office is in a shed outside. Now, usually, I have a little mini heater that I put out there with me. Here's the problem, though. My house was built in, like, 1902, and because of that, the insulation leaves something to be desired. So that bad boy's in here with us. And unfortunately, I have not had time to heat up the office for the remainder of today because I've spent the last two days working on a commission inside. Which means that when I walk out here, it is a actual goddamn icebox. So we're gonna try and make this fast so I don't catch frostbite and lose my toes. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. If you give me someone frost themed after that intro, you cheeky fuck, who we getting? Who we getting? Who we getting? The the Outsiders? Wait a minute, I know for a fact they're not talking about Batman and the Outsiders. They were most assuredly not talking about Batman and the Outsiders. This fucking Dr. Caligari? What the hell is this? First off, I, I'm not gonna fault an artist for not understanding perspective. Very few of us do, but that door is massive. Either this dude is like four foot three or that door is like eight feet tall. I feel like what I'm about to get into with this book is like Monsters vs. Aliens, the comic book, ruled by D Discount Flash Gordon, I guess. This face in the corner is not inspiring much hope. This team feels like a failed Doom Patrol episode. The Outsiders were created in first issue special number 10 of DC Comics in January of 1967 by Joe Simon and Jerry Gardinetti. They are just a team of freaks, and that's not me being rude, that's what they call themselves. Think if the X-Men sucked. This is like the Great Lakes Avengers to the X-Men, but it's in DC. I would try and describe this from memory, but there are five or maybe six members of this team and all of them are weird, so I'm just gonna read this part. The team was made up of Amazing Ronnie, a four-armed green-skinned Cyclops, Lizard Johnny, a squinting, bespeckled frogman who could regrow damaged limbs, immensely strong Mighty Mary, a gorgeous slow-eyed blonde, from the collar up anyway, because the below the neckline she supported thick, 
Fish Scaled Limbs, and Harry Larry, aka the Wheeler Dealer, who is the team's wheelman who is literally bonded to the truck they travel around in. The team is led by someone named Old Doc Scary, who is a cyborg that was mutilated by aliens and given super fast surgeon hands and hides his hideously disfigured face under a rubber mask. The team hides out 20 stories below a hospital that the doctor works at, and they've only appeared in one comic ever. DC ended up recycling them immediately and then using the name for a Batman book. Because let's be real, The Outsiders is a great name and I probably wouldn't want to waste it on this group of Doom Patrol dropouts either. I don't... This concept's so weird it's hard to make fun of. Like it's legitimately hard to make jokes about this team because they just... they feel so half-baked. Did DC think this was gonna be successful? I... I hope not. I doubt that they did. Do we really have to question what I'm gonna rank this? Yeah, this this gets the seal of regret. Maybe use them in a Doom Patrol episode, but I don't I, I don't know what to do with this. So we uh we have a Lex Luthor. It's um If I'm gonna be honest, it wouldn't be my first choice. Or my second. Or my third. Or my 15th. Listen, I'm sure he's gonna do great. He's a great actor. He's done a lot of good roles. I, I really think that he'll probably do a great job. Am I a little worried that we're casting another fast-talking, skinny, kind of adorable actor as Lex Luthor? Yeah, a little bit. I don't want another Jesse Eisenberg. I don't want this to be another Eisenberg Lex Luthor. We've never had a comic book Lex Luthor. And I just, I just want a comic book Lex Luthor. I don't need him to be exact. I just need him to be a little... A little closer than literally any other version we've gotten. I haven't seen the version of, of Lex Luthor from Superman and Lois. The three versions that I know are the three big movie versions. I mean, that's technically cheating because the original Donner Superman films and Superman Returns are supposed to be the same guy. So I got Donner Lex and I have Eisenberg Lex and neither of them knocked me out of the park in any regard. Unless you're talking about leaving the fucking park of my own accord and disgust. I'm looking at you, Jesse. And I mean... Nicholas Holt is pretty much known for a very specific type of role. He usually plays the helper and or side character to a much bigger character in the films that he's in. Usually in a fast-talking and or adorkable sense. X-Men, Renfield, Warm Bodies, I mean the great to a certain extent. I don't get pissed off, egomaniacal, super charming dude out of Nicholas Holt. Or at least not the type of pissed off, egotistical, super charming dude that Lex Luthor is. I will go in with hesitant excitement. Hesitant excitement is the word. Scarlet is fucking, she is on board with this. She loves Nicholas Holt. So she is absolutely down with this casting and I, I'm just nervous. I'm scared. Ever since I saw Nathan Philly and this guy Gardner, I've been really fucking worried about some of these casting choices. Not really. I mean, the rest of them are pre pretty much fine. I mean, th these two specific casting choices. Oh, God. I just, please, please work. I just wanted to work. Come on. So a few days ago, me and Scarlett went to go and watch Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. We're both huge Hunger Games fans. We both love the movie. I'm not here to talk about the movie. If somebody in Marvel's casting office does not cast this man as a young kingpin, I am gonna lose my fucking shit. Literally the entire time that me and Scarlett were watching the movie, I'm like, this man has to be related to Vincent D'Onofrio in some fucking way. This and this cannot be a coincidence. I swear to God, these men have the exact same face. I shit you not, the entire time I was watching that goddamn movie, I was in the back row Googling the shit out of this man's face, trying to figure out the entire time, is he related to him? Is he fucking, is there any connection? I cannot find any, but the resemblance is unfucking canny Marvel, I know Echo already came out, but come on, you, you, you could film some fucking reshoots, right? I needed to get this off of my chest. I needed somebody to hear this fucking shit because I cannot be the only one. And that is gonna be it for these months. I I am so sorry that November was such a rough month for me. I just want to take a moment to thank all of my lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. Amanda Barnstead, Andrell Lanowitz, Anthea Yu, Bilbro, Brandon Bilbrey, Brandon Laney, Christopher Bosgard, Danny Walker, Dev Nicholas, Dominic Vaculo, Dragonfang, Eddie13, Elizabeth Rush, GamerZoom, Gasboss Gatelight Girlkeep, Have a Heart Tin Man, Jacob Safel, Jeffrey Aviles, Jeremy Strickland, Cat Q, Katie Did It, Kathy Coker, 
Max Baker, Midnight Ace Evergreen, Nixie Shimo, Pinchy Moo Gray, Righteous Duke, Ricky Ticky Davi, Shadow Spike, Simply Smithy Jr., Silver Bullets 23, Slytherin Deception, Tangled Web, The Brain Teaser, The Holy Corota, Thickless Mage, International Treasure, Thomas Randolph, Toon Reaper, T.S. Famder, Tyler Ellis, and Wofu Badge 2, as well as all of my other lovely, lovely patrons. And if you too would like your name read out at the end of every single YouTube video I do on this channel, as well as having the ability to vote on new episodes of the Comic Book Book Club as they come out, feel free to hop on over to my Patreon and donate at least $15 or more. Or hey, if that's not an option, even a dollar helps. Good God, I am off of my game, man. Not only do I not have the CBBC out yet, uh, I, didn't, I didn't post for like a month. Thank you guys for being so patient. Thank you guys for still watching this. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Seriously, I am working my ass off trying to get things done. November was a rough one for me, and I'm hoping that December is a little easier. I feel like I say that every single time that I do one of these outros, but uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed, and I will have videos for you guys very, very soon. So I will see y'all in the next one.